Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. On behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Cronin. Andy is the CEO of Avalon. He's joining us for the purposes of our Aviation Leaders Report 2024. And I should say we're recording this in late November. Um, Andy, thanks again for joining us and sharing your insights. Before we get into the meat of the conversation, do you want to tell our watchers, most of whom will know a little bit about Avalon? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Great to be here and thank you for having me. Uh, Avalon is one of the largest aircraft leasing companies in the world with an owned, managed, committed fleet of just under 900 aircraft uh, at the end of the last quarter. Uh, that's globally diversified across about 150 airline customers uh, around the world. We pride ourselves in our ability to connect capital with our customers, with our airline customers, and indeed our trading partners. We're an active seller of aircraft. We've sold close to 400 aircraft uh, over the last decade, actually. Uh, realising over $750 million of trading gains in the process. And maybe Andy, with that breadth of activity, do you want to talk to us a little bit about airline customer performance, um, how it's evolved over 2023, and just are there particular any interesting breakouts in the geographies that you're operating in? Broadly speaking, we see the market as having been very positive through 2023 as the recovery post-COVID continued to move from east to west uh, around the globe. Uh, what we saw over the past couple of months is actually global capacity now surpassing pre-COVID levels, so seat capacity at about 102% of where it was pre-COVID, so that's an important milestone. In terms of financial performance, it's a little bit more mixed. So overall, the health of our portfolio and health of our lessee base and airline customers is uh, strengthening and improving. Uh, we have seen, I would say, some potential cost of living pressures impacting particularly some of the North American low-cost carriers. So that segment uh, has seen slight revenue weakness as we come into the, w the winter season. Uh, but the overwhelming factor is the ongoing driver of growth in the industry, which is demand in Asia. And that co post-COVID recovery, which started about a year and a half later uh, than uh, in North America, is continuing to spread through Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and some of the big uh, economies in that market. Chinese picture is a little bit more mixed, uh, where we've certainly seen domestic capacity surpass COVID, pre-COVID levels for, for some time now, but the long haul build out has been slower uh, than we anticipated. That's rapidly catching up now, uh, but that has been a, a factor which has impacted the broader Asian uh, market for us. So, you know, standing where we are, as you say, strong performance, some worries that are there on the US side, but, but probably still pent up demand that's feeding through in Asia. As you're assessing out into 2024 and your concerns from either a macroeconomic or a geopolitical uh, concern when you're thinking about how airlines are going to perform over the next 12 months. Yeah, we're, we're obviously uh, paid to think about the downside risks a lot and paid to think about what could happen. I, I think it's important to step back sometimes from just the tactical quarter-on-quarter -quarter performance and reflect on that macroeconomic performance that, that you touched on. And I think it's important to remember we've lived through some of the biggest inflections in economic policy uh, that our generation has ever seen, uh, frankly, with the fastest interest rate rise in the US for 40 years, um, with consequential impacts across currency markets, across other markets where we're seeing inflation for the first time in decades in Japan. Uh, we've seen the first uh, real interest rate rises in the Eurozone uh, for this generation of borrowers uh, really start to hit home. And uh, I think it's important to reflect on how fast that change has happened. And while we've seen some moderation in US rates uh, over the past month, uh, I, you know, one area of concern is just the pace of change, consequential impact on currency markets. For example, the yen to the dollar is now close to 150 to 1, which is uh, inconsistent with where it has been over the past 20 years. That has a disruptive effect on investor appetite, on aircraft sales, on aircraft finance. So uh, that's before you get to bigger markets like Turkey, Argentina, where they're running at, you know, 60 to 120 percent inflation depending on when you look at it so i think there are there are big uh macroeconomic pieces that have shifted over the past couple of years 
and they take time to actually filter into economies, people's spending habits, and therefore airline business models. Uh, then uh, on the, the geopolitical side, uh, I think we have to be aware of the potential for escalating trade conflict. And what we've seen uh, really since 2017, when tariffs started to become part of the conversation again, is a growing divergence and deglobalization among some of the major economies in the world. Uh, you layer that into uh, what is, are some significant upcoming elections. Uh, indeed, Argentina uh, just happened this month. Uh, you've also got the likes of Indonesia, uh, Russia, the US, all coming with elections in 2024. And a electorate which is really moving away from the centre. So go, going to either side of the spectrum of left or right, so to speak. So I think 2024 will be a really interesting uh, paradigm where you're seeing potentially big shifts in economic policy, which will have a ripple and have all the ingredients around quick macroeconomic change over the past couple of years, potentially uh, significant inflection points in economic policy across major economies, and that will have a ripple effect uh, in terms of these countries' business activities uh, and aviation growth. And, and maybe honing back in on aviation then in relation to those issues, you know, demand strong, concerns, as you say, on a go-forward basis, but supply is really challenging, right? Yeah. And as, you know, one of the largest lessors in the world with a very significant order book who does a lot of trading of aircraft, as you mentioned, can you talk to us about what impact the supply side issues are having on your business? Absolutely. So the supply side issue primarily uh, is that there are three and a half thousand aircraft that simply were not produced during the COVID years. So a combination of the shutdowns related to MAX and COVID has meant that, uh, for context, about 15% of the global fleet of commercial aircraft that we expected to be in service today are not built. And there is no recovery plan to regain that capacity. So that will take uh, years for that impact on the market to work its way through. What's uh, also been happening is supply chain driven uncertainty around timing uh, of deliveries. That continues to be an issue, but it is abating. There, there is more clarity on the production ramp up with manufacturers. There's more clarity and better visibility on actual delivery slots. Uh, but the fundamental uh, blanket sweep of effectively 15% of global capacity, that's gone. That's not going to get recovered. Uh, and it will take years to even get back to pre-COVID capacity. So in fact, that gap continues to grow. What that's doing to the market then is creating enormous demand for the aircraft that are available. And we've seen that on the, the new aircraft uh, side with airlines extending their commitment horizon out to 2030, 2031, 2032 to lock up slots. Uh, we're seeing manufacturers be more assertive around taking slots back from airlines that they don't think need them. Uh, we're seeing scarcity value of lessor order books increase we're seeing rental uh, placement rentals go up. We're seeing aircraft values go up. Uh, and we're also seeing on the used end of the market, again, enormous demand for used aircraft with uh, the value of green time in particular on engines going up in value. Uh, but also generally, aircraft lives being extended and residual values going up across the board. Uh, within our own global forecast, for which we published in January, uh, we raised a few eyebrows, I think, when we called A330CO rentals up 35% uh, within the year. And we've pretty much hit that now already, actually. Uh, Andy, all that speaks then, as you mentioned, to lease rate factors shooting upwards. Can you talk to us around that? I'm very curious around, one, what you're doing with kind of assets coming off lease, right? So the proportion maybe that you're extending um, and the pricing on that. And then obviously you play a new aircraft both from uh, and your order book perspective and your sale and lease back perspective. Can you talk to us around those segments of the market and what you're seeing from a lease rate factor perspective? Absolutely. So first of all, if you look at our business overall over the past three years, since the first quarter of 21, our lease rate factor on an annualized basis, excluding maintenance yield, has increased by about 100 basis points. Okay? 
Some of that is COVID recovery, aircraft back into service, all of that. Other parts of that are actual real demand increase, yield increase, rentals going up. Uh, we're seeing the vast majority, by which I mean about 70 to 80 percent of airline lessees now seeking to extend aircraft. Uh, that's not always possible or practical. Sometimes we don't reach commercial agreements. Sometimes they've left it too late and we've already committed the aircraft elsewhere. Again, we are seeing airlines move further out in terms of their planning to extend, whereas before they would have operated in a maybe a 12-month horizon. Now they're going 24, 30 months in terms of thinking about extensions. Uh, so that part of the portfolio, it's, it's generally much more cost-effective to extend uh, the aircraft and leave it in situ. You don't have downtime, reconfiguration expense, etc. Uh, so that, that's been uh, a very positive uh, backdrop for the industry. In terms of new aircraft placement, similarly, we're seeing airline play horizon, time horizons move out. We're seeing yields go up uh, in line with what you've seen in the appraiser data, actually. So, you know, I'd say broadly 15% up on new narrowbody uh, aircraft. Uh, and then also on the sale leaseback side, we're seeing a really interesting uh, environment now where actually what has happened is delivery volumes are back. So what we saw during 2021, 2022 was delivery volumes were still compressed and there was a lot of capital available for a small number of deliveries. We're moving back into delivery volume per year being 100 to 120 to 140 billion dollars that requires large-scale capital to actually take delivery of it and in line with the relative choppiness of some of the broader financial markets we're seeing plenty of airlines come for say leaseback financing in a scale that just wasn't there actually in 2021 2022 because the aircraft weren't being delivered uh, we've done about three billion dollars of say leaseback business year to date uh, and we expect that uh, environment to be pretty strong actually over the coming uh, one to two years. And maybe bringing it into trading and asset values then. So, you know, heightened demand, uh, constrained supply, values are clearly going up and that, that's linked around these trade factors. Your thoughts as a large lessor, you say you do trade a lot. You know, you, you're suffering probably some impact on delays on the OEM side and therefore maybe slower to divest, although values are good. How do you deal with that kind of conflicting piece where probably book some pretty nice gains now, but have you got the lift coming in to, to, to kind of compensate for those assets walking out? Uh, it's a constant tightrope. And, uh, you know, I think every large lessor uh, walks along a similar tightrope of balancing liquidity, your balance sheet scale, debt to equity ratio and gearing uh, with your trading volume and a desire to be consistently trading in the market. Uh, so, what we are seeing again is on the buy side, uh, a lot of buyers now making, instead of committing to buy aircraft, the secondary market historically would have been sort of three to six month timeline. We're seeing that also move nine to 12 months now uh, in order for buyers to secure the volume that they want. And that actually helps us because it allows us more certainty and we can plan then on the acquisition side uh, around a similar time frame. So, uh, it, there's no magic answer or silver bullet to that. Uh, there's always multiple factors, whether it's your portfolio risk uh, allocation for certain geographies, asset types, counterparts, uh, whether it's profitability, uh, whether it's uh, taking on uh, the right delivery volume. Uh, all of those things uh, feed into that decision-making process. And, and your assessment on the general health of the trading market you know, I guess one of the challenges we're seeing at the moment is really the lease encumbered asset. So, you know, a lease that was probably extended during COVID for a reasonable period of time was in that lower rate environment. And that to an extent is feeding into trading and probably the investor returns and structured product, sure. which we're seeing struggle a little bit. Can you talk to us on your views on, on that health of the trading market? Yeah, so uh, most but not all investors are rational. So discount factors are gone up. So you know the NPVs and IRORs um, are impacted. So clearly that is an impact in terms of how investors will price. I would say that has been somewhat inconsistent where you've had buyers denominated in other currencies, whether that's yen or renminbi, who are actually fundraising at a different discount rate or looking at it in a different way to the classic US levered 
model. Um, that was a factor primarily for 21, 22, I think, where we saw some, some real um, outlier activity, both on the primary sale leaseback basis and also on the secondary trading market. I think that's largely gone away now, where, where everyone's normalizing to uh, a more consistent view of, of where value is. Equally, I think there's much more confidence now in the market. So people have gotten used to a major increase in interest rates and people are now able to price it. Whereas for a time when rates widened out really in the fall of 2022, um, there was a time when uh, investors weren't sure how to price. So what should they assume? Should they assume rates keep going up at that trajectory, level off, higher for longer, coming down quickly? So it was harder to actually get deals done. Where we see now the market is a much more widespread view of a base case on rates, a much more widespread view of availability or consistent view around availability of capital and cost of capital. And so we're seeing a very firm market where actually the range between bids is actually relatively tight, but there is demand, there is scale demand. Uh, we're obviously missing uh, some of the structured products, so ABSs and so on have not really come back in, in any kind of meaningful scale. Uh, that's maybe something for 2024, that that w confidence will return to that market. And then also, I think there are still short-term currency-driven aberrations in, for example, the Japanese market, uh, where investors are still cautious around deploying capital at current exchange rates. Yeah, so as you mentioned at the start, the, the volatility of the increases was a huge challenge. Then were we going to see a dip? Were we not? Seems that except you say higher for longer on the interest rate side, how do you view the health of the overall aviation debt market then? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I, I, I think there has been a migration to scale. And I think that there is large-scale debt capital available for the large-scale lessors uh, and airlines. I, I, I think the, you know, scale generally makes you more able to deal with volatility in the markets, whatever your business is. And we've seen plenty of volatility, whether that's on the airline demand side, whether that's on interest rates, oil, currency, etc. So generally, we're seeing the larger scale uh, lessors better able to access capital. Investment grade markets have been strong uh, throughout the year. Uh, yes, base rates have increased, but th there's been no questioning the scale and breadth of investment grade lessors' ability to actually raise capital. Uh, we've also seen a lot of liquidity from the Middle East. We've seen the European banking market probably uh, go more towards the large scale names and the investment grade names, with then the, the smaller sort of historic investor buying two or three aircraft. That's where leverage gets more challenging. Uh, and that tends to be the case when things are more volatile. All of the capital providers gravitate towards the lower risk names and then uh, as the general market becomes less volatile, then they spread out and try to get pick up extra yield in the smaller names. And to pick up on that point you mentioned, base rates are clearly up. Uh, you guys have gone back into the unsecured market and, and I'm sure will continue to do that. Are you achieving similar enough spreads to where you were in the low rate environment? No, I'd say spreads for the sector still are somewhat elevated. I, I mean, they have obviously stabilised since uh, the heights of COVID, you know, I think our peak spread during COVID as all the lessors, you know, was in the probably seven or 800 basis points of spread. So the market was effectively inaccessible for a period of time. Uh, things have greatly normalized, but there's still a way to go. I mean, if you look at the pre-COVID spreads of the investment grade lessors, uh, I, I think that there's still some distance to travel. You're also seeing uh, positive rating action, right? I mean, remember throughout COVID, there wasn't a single investment grade less that were downgraded. And what we're now seeing is much more widespread positive outlook or positive rating changes across those investment grade lessors. But we haven't actually seen any new entrant into that investment grade lessor space. Uh, so I think that the rating agencies are continuing to drive or to recognize the performance that they saw uh, through COVID. And that's going to drive further tightening of spread. So I certainly think there's more room to travel on that. 
And maybe on the investor side, you know, Avalon's a really interesting story where you go from private equity to publicly listed to Chinese capital to Chinese and Japanese capital. So, so a lot of different investors and you've played a lot in structured products where I'm sure a lot of private equity and other types of investors have come in to some of the ABSs you've done or other ventures. Can you talk to us about your perception of the investor market now in aviation finance? And have we seen any interesting evolution in that community of investors post-COVID? We've certainly seen a disconnect between private valuations and public market valuations. So uh, you look at where some of the private platform trades have happened, that, that is clearly valued differently to where public market investors are valuing the public uh, lessors. I think also before COVID, what we were seeing was a lot of appetite from infrastructure type investors who had not historically invested in aircraft leasing, um, but were certainly around the edges and starting to make significant investments in the space before COVID. COVID, they clearly pulled back from that space. But now we're starting to see them resurface. And these are people who are looking for private ownership, are looking for a decade or multi-decade long ownership cycle, and are seeking a stable return uh, that is lower than, for example, a private equity or a public market uh, investor would appear to demand in the current environment. Uh, I think also what we've seen is uh, purely relative value. Uh, what we did see during COVID uh, and indeed pre-COVID was an awful lot of managed LP money from the US come into the sector. And I, I think a lot of that has actually started to slow down and seek other non-aviation related investments or invest in other parts of the value chain because the US market is very liquid. And one of the impacts of that very high liquidity is when relative value or relative returns change, the capital goes elsewhere much more quickly than in other markets. And our sector is quite unique in that it does operate on that sort of one decade or multi-decade long investment cycle and investment thesis. It's very long dated capital, it's resilient, it's able to withstand pandemics and Russia and oil crises and all of the, the things that make our industry great. Um, but um, it is a long dated play and it's a long-dated investment thesis. So I, I think a lot of the short-term capital that maybe underwrote volume was bridge financing it on a short-term basis uh, in the hope that interest rates would drop or there would be a, a, a rapid exit and so on. I think a lot of that capital uh, is you know, probably limiting incremental investment uh, and the long-dated capital is ultimately going to win out. And maybe thinking about the, the macro leasing environment, you, know, you touched on when we were talking about debt around the importance of scale, you know, the IG rated lessors, just being able to access a deeper pool of capital. Um, that if you follow that thesis through, it pushes to a smaller number of larger players, which in theory would be consolidation. We've seen some, right? Probably in that 100 to 150 aircraft type uh, uh, platform. We think of Gossock, Standard Charter recently, AMCK. Your thoughts on do we need to see more or will we see more consolidation in that space and does it start to funnel into the top 10 or top 12 or whatever it might be? Yeah, and if you look back over the last 10, 15 years, we've actually seen fragmentation, right? We, we've seen the, the concentration move from the large lessors holding about two thirds of the global fleet to down around 45%. And actually the, the past year or two is the first time that trend reversed and we started to see uh, more consolidation. Also, obviously, the, the GCAS uh, aircap uh, transaction, a big part of that. Um, what's almost more influential for us is what we've seen is much more significant consolidation in order books. And I think that's a change in strategy with the manufacturers, where order books are now gravitating towards the larger lessors. And if you look back at the manufacturer behavior over the past decade. And one of the problems with the market pre-COVID, because pre-COVID we were talking about low placement rates, we were talking about uh, challenges in certain markets around yields for uh, certain asset types. Um, a big part of that was actually the order books had become really fragmented. And there were a lot of small scale platforms who had placed large orders and some non-platforms who had placed 
large-scale orders. And in many cases, it was the worst form of order. It was a lot of speculative risk delivering in a concentrated time frame, which saturated the market. So I, I think the manufacturers now have both uh, Airbus and Boeing made a strategic decision to uh, be much more conscious of that impact on the market for their product. And therefore, I think they are really consolidating around the larger lessors as their main order book customers from the leasing channel. So I hope that we don't see that sort of tail end of smaller scale platforms accessing disproportionate order books uh, in, the, in hope value, right? It's a, it's a one-way option value for, for their equity provider. Um, and I think that trend will continue then. I, I think there will be a smaller and smaller number of large order books uh, driving larger platforms uh, and larger delivered fleets. As to whether there are fragmenta continued fragmentation in ownership, or uh, I think it's a good thing to have multiple investors come in and own uh, existing portfolios as investments, uh, they're buying and trading and that, that's our secondary market. So we, we want to encourage that investment. What we want though is that that supply of new metal into the market uh, is a, a limited number of counterparts who are credible actually in terms of behaving rationally through economic cycles. Yeah, it's really interesting. As you say, consolidation really happens gradually over time as the bigger get bigger and, and rolling off from an order book perspective and maybe looking at the wider leasing channel you know i think probably had less source funding near 60 percent of new deliveries over the last few years yep. uh, be that order books or sale and lease back channel and um, probably taken down a slight bit this year potentially right as, as airlines generate a lot of cash your perspective on what that medium term outlook looks like if you kind of say from a value perspective we're definitely north of 55 from a number perspective we're north of 50 where do you see those going yeah first of all i think that the value proposition of a leasing company is much stronger now than it has ever been at any point in the history of aircraft financing because if you believe the thesis that uh, airlines and aircraft are balance sheet intensive, which they are, uh, you then take the view that the, the definition, the value out of an aircraft leasing business is that it is a lower risk business model than a direct airline business model and is therefore able to attract capital at a lower cost than individual airlines. And it provides value to the aviation sector by being that lower risk uh, way and lower cost way to provide capital to the industry. Post COVID, I think those facts are now indisputable that you've had the investment grade lessors, as I mentioned, go through COVID without any downgrades. You look at that and compare it to the multiple airlines uh, downgrades around the world, the difficulty accessing capital, the level of support that lessors gave to airline customers around the world through COVID and the value that it provides in terms of now mapping this uh, bottleneck in supply to where there's excess capacity in the world and redeploying that capacity to where it's needed around the world. So fundamentally, I think the value of an aircraft leasing business, not in terms of the balance sheet value or the any one business, but of the sector, is proven now to be higher uh, than at any point over the past few decades. So therefore, I do think that the, its market share and its footprint will grow. Uh, I think you're also seeing a reduction in the bank market. Uh, I think you're seeing uh, some level of uh, contraction in the export credit market, certainly to, to where it would have been a decade ago. Um, and that gap is largely being filled, actually, by, by leasing capital. So, you know, do I think we get to more than two-thirds of the global fleet? No, there will always be cash financed. There will always be debt finance, there will always be tax products, structured products, etc. But I think that that 60% to two thirds level is very achievable for the sector. Mm. And shifting gears a little bit, Arlene, and, and talking on ESG, would particularly focus on the environmental piece. Your perspectives as a large lessor on your ability to attract debt or in talking to investors, how high are ESG concerns on their radar? Uh, I th it's a really interesting question and uh, you know there was a aircraft leasing Ireland uh, gathering last week actually to, to discuss a lot of these issues 
And one of the points that I made is it, it's a very inconsistent picture around the world. So the E part of ESG is hugely topical for European banks, hugely topical. Uh, but if we look at our business, 12% of our customers are in Europe and about 12% of our capital comes from Europe. And outside of Europe, we're not seeing the same level of discussion, debate around either what needs to be achieved or more importantly, how it needs to be achieved. And there are very different strategies around the world with the US employing much more incentives, the EU uh, deploying much more in the way of penalty uh, in order to drive their, their uh, respective environmental goals. So right now, you know, we are not seeing a huge difference in availability of capital, uh, or in fact any difference in availability of capital, and we're seeing a relatively modest difference in the cost of capital uh, between, say, a structured green bond, or uh, however you might define that, and an ordinary on-the-run wholesale funding uh, in the bond market. Having said that, we do firmly believe uh, in the environmental agenda. We do believe in our supporters of the, the goal to achieve net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, I think it's clear that the, the pathway to do that hasn't been fully fleshed out yet. It is a work in progress across multiple industry stakeholders. Um, we pride ourselves in being very much at the forefront of trying to develop that pathway, wh whether that's uh, a collaborative working group we led on sustainable aviation fuel or an investment in eVTOLs and uh, work around some batteries that feed into the eVTOLs, etc. So I think there, there are opportunities for everyone uh, on this journey uh, to achieve the net zero goal, but it is going to come at a cost and it is going to impact the business models of ourselves, our customers, and indeed uh, the decision for the traveling public to fly. And maybe just briefly <coughs> on that SAF point, because I know you guys have done uh, some feasibility studies and assessments around it. Curious as to the role you think aircraft lessors might play in terms of SAF development. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting one. Our, our value add right now is what we've got is a global network of customers where we have the opportunity to make connections, accelerate the commercialization of early stage technology like we did with the eVTOLs. Uh, but we are not an infrastructure investor. We are not someone who builds oil refineries. We are not someone who builds SAF plants. And so our role is primarily uh, around trying to accelerate that journey, uh, fill the gaps where they can be filled. Um, but I, I don't think any of the large scale lessors will become owners or majority investors in SAF plants in the near term. And maybe in closing, Andy, we talked about a market that uh, high demand, challenge supply, um, we, but we've, we've come out of a place that we're probably all happy where we are now versus three years ago. Looking out into 2024, what are your optimism levels like? Extraordinarily high. Uh, it's exciting, right? I, I mean, it, it's really exciting. So all of the COVID work, so to speak, is behind us. Um, but the management teams of our airline customers, of the leasing platforms, are all better because they've come through a journey where there was more transaction activity, restructuring activity, adopting business models in that two to three year period than you would often get in an entire career. And so the opportunity now to use that in what is a rapidly changing macroeconomic environment, uh, where you've also got the longer term structural trends where business models will be changing, is what's really going to drive returns for our business and for our competitors' business around the world uh, and that's a really exciting time to be working in our industry and in our business where you've got this underlying demographic growth which is just so resilient uh, that people want to travel coupled with these massively interesting challenges and opportunities uh, coming at the business over the next 24, 36 months. Well, Andy, on that very positive note, I'd like to thank you on behalf of KPMG and Ireland Economics for your insights and wish you and Avalon a very successful 2024. Super. Thanks, Joe.